Um, can I just begin, Frank, by asking you, as someone who's involved in this chain of command, having seen Nelly kind of erupt into this system, smash it open and then depict it in this way, what your initial kind of reaction was from seeing your, your world shown like that? Oh, when I saw the movie, um, first, I did not believe that Nelly will go all the way to United Nations because that's a very difficult thing to do. And to meet these people, Linne Johnson, uh, the NASA Hems director, I mean, it's a very complicated uh, process, uh, paperwork, but also a lot of, uh, you need to really believe you're gonna be able to do it. So I'm glad, most of the people you see in a movie, I know them by name, I've seen them by emails, we talk to each other on a regular basis, but I didn't see them on the video, I never saw them like uh, people from the, from the minor planet. I, it was the first time I saw them, in fact. And, and, and do you think it's kind of accurate depiction of, of this world? Because to me, I have to say, I don't know about you guys, it didn't inspire much confidence in the fact that we <laughs> actually have the systems capable of dealing with uh, you know, near-Earth impact. Do, do you think it, it shows the kind of true reality behind the scenes? Yeah, well, think about it. We have, um, uh, we have people who work even when it's a weekend and even when it's, when it, when it's New Year. New Year. Uh, we have people who are very dedicated to their, to their work. Scientists are like that. I mean, s look at uh, Peter Jennings can. This guy is crazy. Uh, Sudan was in war at the time, and he basically came to my office and he told me, I'm, I want to go to Sudan. Do you want to go with me? I said, no way, I'm not going to Sudan. <laughs> 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 and he went there, and he found this piece of rock, and that's been a gigantic big step ahead for us because he basically showed that we can detect an asteroid beforehand, study it, and then find the fragments on the ground Nobody believed that was possible mm, before. Mm. Nelly, can we just kind of rewind to the beginning? What was it that drew you to, to make this film in the first place? Well, that's going to be like a two hours answer type of question. But uh, yeah, I mean, it started really with the International Space Orchestra. I mean, you know, I always been fascinated by, you know, uh, NASA as in NASA pathos and, you know, what sort of like, how could I get the, to the core of the difficulty to be one of the space operator who have to change, you know, all of their, um, all of their, all of their expertise every time an administration change because obviously NASA is, uh, you know, a governmental agency. So every time there is a new government, there is a new aim, a new goal. So either it's Mars, either it's the asteroid. So if you're in Mars and uh, you're in the wrong administration, then uh, and then they say that the new, you know, the the new. Um, the new focus is an asteroid, then you have to just relearn everything and go for the asteroid. And it's kind of like, you know, I mean, to me, it was there is there was something really interesting there about the role of a scientist and trying to actually keep on fulfilling your passion and at the same time having to deal with all this administration and all the, you know, all of the procedures and all the bureaucratics that come with it. So the International Space Orchestra was looking at that, was looking at getting this, you know, I mean, it, for those of you who don't know about the International Space Orchestra, it's, uh, it's an orchestra made of space scientists who reenact the drama of mission control during the Apollo 11 mission. So in you that sense- You make it sound like it's something that already existed, which just clarify, Nelly kind of again invited herself to NASA, hammered NASA until they let her in, and, and kind of forced them to, to set up this orchestra. So it was a, a construct, it wasn't- you know, Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, you know, <laughs> yes, it's true, it's true. And, um, and so, you know, it, this is where it really started for me. I wanted to really push this further, and to some extent, having the International Space Orchestra as there, as a support, because I mean, you need to remember as well that some of the members of the International Space Orchestra now made it to become part of the project management team of the film as well. So like, for example, Annette Rodriguez, who is our ukulele player in the International Space Orchestra, but also trained astronaut for like 35 years, started to navigate all of the bureaucracy as well to get us access to all of, you know, all of these people. But I think really what fascinated me in this was, of course, the bureaucracy. I think I'm ob absolutely obsessed by system and structures. And I wanted to really figure out for myself what was in place and who were the key actors there. But also, it was really kind of trying to figure out actually who were these people, how would they react to such an extreme situation? And actually, could I come up with a strategy or a method that will give us, members of the public, the possibility to actually really witness how they will behave on the day? So it might look a bit gimmick, but then obviously, I, I, in France, we have this uh, famous dramaturge called Antonin Artaud, and he came up with this notion of a theater of cruelty. 
So that's what my character is playing in the film. Like I'm kind of very rude to them. I'm trying to push them to the extreme to actually get to the core of what their performance will be on the day. Uh, and I think as much as I was a friendly character in the International Space Orchestra, I turned up into a very uh, intense uh, French character on the other one, like the, a bit like the voice of Hal in a way, in a, in a hell Hal yeah, uh, in a 2001, like the sort of, you know, the one that he's trying to like figure out. But yeah, so there is that and then, Sorry, I'm like trying to answer yeah, your question yeah, well in a short manner, but uh, <laughs> there is that and there is also this fascination that I had about trying to figure out a way so that I can get a scientist to actually reflect on what they are doing and why they are doing it. And also trying to figure out, you know, whether or not, what is their, what is a role model when something like that happens? And I guess uh, when it comes to it, fiction has a big role to play in this. So, you know, do you look at Bruce Willis when you have to behave in this type of scenarios that obviously you have never enacted before? Or who, who, who do you behave like Oppenheimer? Do, you know, what sort of role model do you put in place there? And that was a, a recurrent question all the way through the filming. And of course, you know, you've got Baudrillard. Uh, mm. who is, yeah, I wanted uh, to ask why, why Baudrillard? Why is he who's your kind of new narrator for this film? He, I mean, he really became my partner in crime through the whole film. I mean, obviously, he's, uh, he, he went in the US back in the 80s and he did this whole journey through the entire US and to some extent I was I was really inspired by this whole notion of like apparel, real, you know, the fact that suddenly fiction become more important than the actual truth or the actual mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. And you know, suddenly we look at fiction as being even more interesting and we should actually be in that fiction more than where mm -hmm. we are now. So, you know, NASA trophy, NASA, uh, all NASA co compo tax, uh, you know, and all of these things. Like nothing has any meaning today is a sort of like the statement. It's kind of bringing in a sort of, uh, maybe more of a critical look all the way through the film and the more of a bitter sense as well on the sort of the huge task at hand for all of them. Because obviously we as members of the public believe that science should fulfill the role of Bruce Willis mm -hmm. and they should save us. But then of course for them it's this sort of like they are let alone with no budget. That's basically all the people you saw on the film are the one that will have a role to play if something like that was to happen. Now two of them are actually retired so we are not in a very good position right now. But can, can I uh, just stop you there for a minute um, yeah. and ask Frank, you know, g g given Nelly is trying to reenact this kind of theater of cruelty and you were one of her victims, so to speak, what was she cruel enough? Do you think she kind of pushed you guys beyond your well, comfort zones to kind of draw out things that wouldn't otherwise have been shown? Well, basically when she came to speak to me in my case, we recorded for half a day and then a day at, at Leak Observatory. And what you can see in a movie is when I was really not I was not thinking that she was recording, basically. Right, so, right. And she did that with almost everybody. So she puts us into this situation where kind of, uh, we, we, were, we all used to speak to the media at the City Institute especially. And so we, when the camera run, we start talking very scientist and very boring, most likely. <laughs> so she knew that because she has seen that in the, some uh, Discovery Channel uh, or Nat National Geographic <laughs> <laughs> stuff. And she basically push us, push us, push us. And then I remember this, uh, having the camera and the microphone passing in front of me and you asking me to move this. And could you move your fist this way? Could you just look at? And after a while, I, I was basically, OK, well, I'm going to do whatever she asked me to do. And <laughs> <laughs> I become submission. where I am, in yeah. fact. <laughs> and is that where these props come in? Because they were the kind of elephant in the room, you know, the red phone in the film. How, what was the role of the dinosaur, the phone, the, the UN flags, the little props? Was that another kind of technique of bombardment to get people out of their comfort zones? I mean, yeah, you know, the film is only one part of the entire project. There is the exhibition, there is like 13 clips in which we, you know, we have been looking at other emergency procedures, not only the one of, you know, the one of the asteroid and what, what sort of chain of command there is in place. So, in a way, each of these props were looking specifically at one scenario, like the contamination scenario, the uh, extension scenario with the dinosaur and so on. So, these props initially were made for the exhibition. And then, of course, I started to realize that there were a real potential there in terms of how I could actually get them to believe that, that I mean, or actually be really annoyed with me. Like having, a, you know, having a, a, a prop like this straight into an office actually really create this sort of tension that I was looking for. I mean, I'm a strong believer that actually you can get to the core of 
how people really are by actually really getting to that inch of like she's or he is going to screw me out of his office. Mm. Did, did it ever go that far? Did you push them yeah. hard enough to switch off the yeah, cameras? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the first uh, the first day of the shoot we started, and you know, I was just meeting the team. Uh, Catherine, uh, the director of photography, who actually, you know, she came and she was like, okay, where is the script? And I was like, well, no, we, we don't have any script, which was already, which was interesting as well, because I was doing a film as well about the American culture. And I mean, the American culture when it comes to like catastrophe and how they deal with catastrophe too. Uh, and I was looking at that specifically and like, the, you know, the, all mm. the Hollywood role in this. And so Catherine was coming from LA, and so the stylistic, you know, uh, power that she brought in it was really interesting, of course, because I was looking at doing a film about mm, America mm. too. Sorry, I forgot what I was so talking about. the American say. culture, what was the role of the, the cowboy? What, what, what kind of symbol is he? Well, I mean, he's a recurrent character. As well. why, yeah. why aren't the boots on tonight? Yeah, and no, no boots tonight. Uh, you know, I'm not, play, I'm not performing anymore. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, yeah, he's done now. But I guess, uh, I mean, it's done. We still have the boots, huh, if anyone is interested. Uh, but, um, sorry, I'm... Uh, the, the, the cowboy, what was the role of the... Uh, yeah, the he I was mean, the one so that didn't yes. really fit <laughs> into the rest <laughs> of the, the chain yeah, yeah, of command. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Baudrillard has been looking specifically at like the, the extreme character of the American culture. So you've got the jogger, you've got the cowboy, and it, it kind of made sense as well that we will have this cowboy and this jogger as part of the film, but also Clint Eastwood and the way that he's like saying the end of the world and you know how we can try and like get back to the core of this as well. Like I was, I wanted to have this character on board to actually also give their, um, you know, their, their sort of their side of the story and whether or not they will have actually a role to play if something was to happen. But then yes, I guess it, it was bringing in again that fiction component, bringing in again. Uh, all this uh, specific Hollywood culture into into the film, mm -hmm. and actually having that clash between what was the the reality of each of these scenes and uh, and the sort of aspiration that Hollywood has for uh, for catastrophe and uh, the way it should be and could be and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, Frank. Just coming back to the whole chain of command, I was really surprised at the role of the amateurs uh, and how so much of the process of kind of monitoring seems to be left to this world of kind of hobbyist. Astronomers. I mean, are they really a crucial part of, of this, um, you know, uh, monitoring system? Yeah, because they're numerous, in fact, and they're everywhere on the planet. So those are basically people who most like most of the time really w wanted to become astronomer for some reason could not, and they basically have uh, some uh, very good equipment in their in the garden in their uh, or they share them. And they uh, they observe for us, and they follow up basically our database regularly. And s most of the time, they become even better at finding uh, comets and asteroids. I mean, mm. we have some of them on, in the movie. Those people are remarkable in a way because they have a day day job, and then in the evening they uh, they spend the night observing the, the the events for us. Yeah, and they process the data themselves, and they push us too. They're a very important part of the scientific community in astronomy because they force us to uh, to be better. Because now they're catching up on us right, right. in the technology, in the way they conduct the observation, the efficiency on the sky. So we're trying to get to since we are paid for that, we're trying to be better than them. Of course, M might they overtake? I mean, is there a, a danger that this kind of decentralized uh, world there is a amateur astronomers could, could well trump the, the SETI Institute? And no, and we work we work together a lot. And uh, we exchange, uh, I mean, some of my papers have amateur astronomers as a co-author. I mm. think it's, it's, it's a fair deal because they contribute significantly. I mean, we see here for asteroids uh, detection, or comet detection, some of them observe Jupiter or Saturn continuously. So now we have movies of Jupiter and Saturn when it's visible in the sky 24-7. Mm. That's mm. remarkable because they, we use combination of all these observ observers around the planet to get the, those data. Nelly, can I just ask you quite specifically about um, this film as a design project? Because you're always very adamant that you're a designer and not a filmmaker. And I, I suppose to me in the International Space, yeah. or Space Orchestra, it was very clearly a project to kind of go in and almost behave like this team bonding consultant where you were the kind of icebreaker to get these slightly dysfunctional people to, to work together. Mm -mm -mm. Would you see your role in this film being the same? Or are you kind of trying to crack open the floors within the chain of command? What, how, how is it a design project in that sense? Well, I guess the first part was really into re revealing actually what the, you know, what the procedures are, what is the structure in place, and how I could come up with a method again to try and reveal that to members of the public. 
But there is another part as well of the project, which was actually trying to make it visible to them too. Uh, which is the interesting part, I guess, from the film and from what happened since we actually released the film. It's actually the film got shown at their Planetary Defense Conference in Frascati, mm -hmm. in Italy. And so all of them were there. And like you said, none of you actually really met or really actually knew each other. So suddenly they could actually see each other's performance on the screen. And while I was really panicking about the fact that actually they could really take it in the wrong way or it will show them in a way that they wouldn't like to be seen. Actually, they really took it in a way that I, I was hoping them to take it, which is basically, let's reassess now, let's actually rethink about the procedure, let's rethink about the ecosystem in place, let's try and figure out actually for ourselves how we can, you know, come up with procedures that can actually work, that we can each play a role and actually each be in touch with each other. So I think it created that community. So if you mm -hmm. say that it's kind of quite different from the International Space Orchestra, it still pretty much created a community within a community, which is already there, right? But it, to some extent, kind of got to meet each other through their performances yeah, to some extent. Yeah. Now, after that, I, in terms of design, I. I, for myself, believe that design is and should be extended to the role of, you know, the producer, the role of the editor, the role of uh, the maker of this project in which you can really engineer situations that can generate critical thinking or, uh, you know, within an institution or within member of the public. So that's what I was set to do with this specific project, is to try and come up with a way that I can actually get them to think and reflect about their role as scientists, but also, you know, there is this there is this notion which is there since like post-war, Anna Arendt, Oppenheimer, of course, and his responsibility with the, uh, the atomic bomb and him saying, oh, look, I wasn't, that wasn't my, wasn't my deal really to be in charge of the politics. I just did the technology and then what happened next, I don't know anything about it. Mm. And so there have always been in science this dichotomy between, you know, politics and uh, science and what science will fulfill, data, seeking for data, and then that's pretty much it. But when you are as part of a chain of command, and your role is not only to, you know, your role is, of course, to look for the data, but there is also this notion of passing it on to the next person. Then, of course, you're taking a political stand. Do you pass on or not the data? And I was trying to figure out a way in which I could combine these two body into, a, into an experience, which was the one that you've seen on the screen, and mm. I think it's, I mean, after we can see all, all the layers of the film, we can like go and dig through all of it and all the reason why you only see me from the back. I mean, all of these things are there. Like, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's for them as well to kind of the scene in the scene and where are they within that and all of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah.